Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I'm a Southern girl, and I'm really, really, I really, really appreciate the kind of call and response at Park Cultural, not to do much with the South, but my African American Southern heritage. But so I appreciate your responding. Um, and it's really a pleasure for me to be here. It's nice to see Louisa, who was a graduate student at Harvard when I was an assistant professor. So this is a very nice connection, David. Thank you for inviting me. Um, President Lawrence, thank you um, for the introductions. Uh, to the conference, and um, I stand here today to talk to you about a topic and subjects that are very, very dear to my heart, um, and to talk through the prism in the lenses of education as one of our most fundamental social institutions in society. And I want to talk to you about um, the reframing of a social problem, of an educational problem, and reframing it. My colleague Kevin Wellner and I put out an edited volume last year. Uh, entitled Closing the Opportunity Gap, as Louisa said, what America must do to give all children an even chance. And one of the main arguments we make in that book is that it is time to take away or to um, switch our attention from the so-called outputs, the achievement gaps, which are really symptoms, and, and, and focus on the inputs, on the things that actually engender and create the problems that we have, and to talk about the opportunity gap. And so I want to talk to you about why it is important to focus on the determinants of achievement gaps and how they contribute and reproduce the problem of inequality in American society. And I want to start by talking, um, by quoting from the person who's the namesake of the organization that I, uh, where I am the faculty director, and this is the former Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare under President Lyndon Baines Johnson. And John W. Gardner once wrote in his book entitled, Excellence, Can We Be Equal and Excellent Too? He wrote, and I quote, the phrase equality of opportunity is and will probably continue to be the expression most favored by Americans to reflect their beliefs with respect to that dimension of equality that has to do with achievement. That is not to say that most Americans have thought hard about what equality of opportunity requires. It requires the removal of every removable obstacle to the fulfillment of the individual, whether prejudice or ignorance or physical impairment, whatever. It means that those without status or wealth or membership in a privileged group will have full access to opportunity." End of quote. This is one of the quotes which sticks in my mind most about some of the writings that John W. Gardner uh, produced, and his sentiments, I would argue, are just as relevant today as when he wrote them 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, in 1961. What I want to talk about here today, as I mentioned, is to think about this notion of achievement gaps versus opportunity gaps and how they actually fuel the problem of inequality in American society. In terms of, of America's youth's overall educational well-being, these terms have dominated policy discussions over the past 20, 30 years. Meanwhile, I, we argue in our work, and I want to say today, that relatively little attention has been paid to the gaps that are most fundamentally at odds with American ideals. The strong preoccupation with testing, with measuring achievement, has led to a mountain of unintended consequences. And by many accounts, the 2002 No Child Left Behind law has produced severely anemic results in many districts across the country. But scant attention has been paid to measuring or addressing inequitable opportunities, and policy has frequently failed to engage with the challenges, supports, and resources that would create deep and substantial improvements in student learning across all social groups. Now, when we began to contend with the myriad aspects of society that would require our attention to tackle the barriers to equality of opportunity, my colleagues and I knew that we had to think holistically, to think about what I call in my own work the ecology of children's lives. Vast opportunity gaps limit children's future prospects every day in schools across every community in America. Talent is being wasted, particularly in communities of color and low-income communities. And many of the children in these communities do not reach their full potential and are not closing what we call gaps in achievement be precisely because 
they are not receiving equitable and meaningful opportunities to reach their potential. And this narrow focus on the test score gaps predictably leads to policies grounded in high stakes testing, which in turn, I would argue today, leads to narrow thinking about groups of students, their teachers, and their schools. While these assessments attempt to determine where students are, they ignore how they may have gotten there and what alternative pathways might be available for students in the future. In my short time, I want to make two broad points about the opportunity gap. And um, I want to say that, first of all, the, the main comment, the main premise of this, the work that I've done in the last year on closing the opportunity gap is to call our attention to the idea that a multidimensional problem deserves multidimensional solutions that focus not only on schooling and education, but also the extra school environments, from housing, communities and neighborhoods, the workforce and wages, healthcare, and the forces that fuel what we're now calling the school to prison pipeline, and so forth. But let me start by saying what these opportunity gaps look like. Uh, uh, let me back up first for a moment. For those of you who are not, who would like to know what I mean or the differentiation between achievement gaps and opportunity gaps, let me say that the achievement gap frames tend to emphasize the outcomes, as I said earlier. Grades, tests, scores, graduation rates, college going rates. Now, outcomes are critical, and they are determined by a host of key factors. But the opportunity gap approach that we outline in our work focus on the inputs, the conditions that shape that, and we argue that only high quality outcomes can occur when we focus and, and, and introduce high quality inputs. And those are the things where we argue the attention needs to focus on, particularly in policy and practice. So what do these opportunity gaps look like? Well, here's one proxy at the student and family level. In 2013, the poverty rate was at 22% for all children under the age of 18. That's more than one in five children. Now the poverty rate, this poverty rate is about the same as it was in 2010, which was the highest poverty rate since 1993. And the numbers have decreased slightly between 2010 and 2013, but it remains constant in terms of the proportion of children under 18. In absolute or numerical terms, there are more white children living in poverty, at just over 5 million, but this constitutes only about 14% of all white children in America. For black and Latino, Latino youth, however, the proportions living in poverty are significantly more disparate and depressing. Nearly three times as many African American and black children are living in poverty, and more than twice as many Latino, Latina children are living in poverty. And this radical disproportionality by race and class is what I refer to as the color of poverty or even the racialization or ethnicization of poverty. If you look at this graph here, you can see it broken down or disaggregated by race and ethnicity across American society. This is based on the, on, on the this is a data, these are data from the National Center for Children in Poverty and the source of this is based on our national census data. But you can see, just looking at this, and by low income, we're talking about children who are within about 125% of the poverty line, and these are children who are living at or below the poverty line. It is becoming increasingly more normative in our society for children who are black and brown to live in poverty, more than two thirds. These are children under the age of 18. We can also, so that's in terms of household income. We can also look at these issues in terms of the ethnicization um, and racialization of poverty by thinking about the changing different demographics in our society. And I decided to take a look at that. If you look at the number of school-aged children speaking a language other than English in the United States, you'll see that it is more than doubled between 1980 and 2012, from 4.7 million to 12 million. In 2012, almost a fifth of all children under the age of 18 are foreign born or reside with at least one foreign born parent in this country. And 41% of Hispanic children between the ages of six and 18 have parents with no high school diploma. We are talking about very different material circumstances, uh, socioeconomic circumstances for children who are, many of whom are first generation or second generation. And children of foreign born parents are more likely to live in these low income houses that are households that we talked about. More data. 
In terms of thinking about the English proficiency of parents, you can see this is broken down by children and immigrants in this country. Um, the children of immigrants with limited English proficiency, and you know, in terms of uh, being able to speak contextually, to speak English, to be able to acquire jobs, et cetera, et cetera, we're talking about 60% of immigrant children in this country live in LEP households. And then it's further disaggregated by children from various parts of the world here. Uh, more import it's important to see here that uh, Mexico, which is the highest uh, um, demographic group, highest percentage or proportion of, ch of children who are living in li English, limited English uh, proficient households. The metaphor that I tend to use as I think about the circumstances of children in this country materially um, is one of thinking about um, how it is that we're expecting children who are what I call riding bullet train speed elevators to success to, to compete with kids who are on broken stairwells where there are no handrails. And they're all expected to get to the proverbial floor 16, i.e. graduate from college. Yet they have radically different circumstances to which they are uh, exposed. If you look at the median net worth of households here in this country, you'll see that even if we look beyond what's coming in the household in terms of everyday wages, wealth, which is transmitted generationally, if you look at the most recent data, this is from the Pew Research Center, it you see that on average, this is the median, 50% or more of whites in this country have a median household income, a wealth of 113,000 plus. And look at that, how many more times that is for Latinos and blacks. So we're talking about great, great disparity in terms of the material context. And here is the color of poverty and wealth broken down even more by, um, by ethnicity. I included Asians in here um, as well, looking at the most recent census data. It is radically different um, for these groups who are black and brown. And they are being required to compete to actually produce the same results. When we talk about the achievement gaps, we're talking about significant mean score differences on testing um, and, and, and graduation and various other outputs without considering the fact that we're comparing apples and oranges and peaches, all very good fruit as far as I'm concerned, but different groups proverbially, uh, and, and, and not to be disrespectful, but they're different groups materially. And I think this is a really an important point to drive home as we talk about why it is that some groups are thriving and other groups are not thriving. So here we go. You got the kids who are doing quite well on the speedy elevators, going to some of the finest schools, well-maintained modern buildings, the most sophisticated technological advances, functioning heating and air conditioning, and in a day like today, you know, heat is really matters. The latest textbooks, the best, the most highly trained teachers, the most highly experienced, they have attended high quality preschool before enrolling in the local public school. Um, they are taught in a language that is primarily spoken at home. They have safe transportation to and from school. They live in neighborhoods where they feel safe and can easily access community resources. They often attend enriching after school and summer long learning programs. Many of the kids on the speedy bullet train elevators spend time traveling in the summers with their parents and their family members. They have adequate food for breakfast at home. They're, they are able to obtain help from tutors and other learning supports. They have health insurance and access to health care providers so that they can stay healthy and be productive. They acquire the asthma medication and eyeglasses they need to learn. Children on the smooth riding escalators, they may not have quite as many of those resources, but many of them are, 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 are exposed to similar uh, conditions and contexts. Many of these kids are also the children of those who are, have uh, uh, parents who have gone to college. And they are on the path, even though the middle class is shrunk in American society um, and the middle class is getting squeezed, many of these kids are still going to do significantly better than those who are here on the broken stairways, sways, where they attend older schools, buildings not functioning with heating or air conditioning, outdated textbooks off the time, limited school library. I've been in some of these schools, many of these schools across the country. They're segregated with few students from middle class or wealthy families. They do not have access to high quality preschool. 
They face out of school zero tolerance suspension policies. They have difficulty communicating with their teachers and students often if English is not their first language. They find it hard to understand their teachers and homework because they come from a family where English is not the primary spoken language. They do not have a safe way to get to school many times and have few if any enriching after school programs and certainly are not traveling to Europe or Asia or Africa in the summers with their families. The summer setback as sociologists of education is a big issue because the extra school things that actually contribute to our learning curves are not something that the, to which they are exposed. Many of them arrive at school hungry. They have inexperienced and poorly trained and poorly supportive teachers oftentimes and have less success, access to enriching arts and music, social studies and science classes. The broken stairwell ki well, kids are, no matter what the mode of mobility is, all of these groups are being expected to achieve at the same level. And when they do not, that's what we call the achievement gap, those differences in time to the top, those differences in times in output, and we tend to normalize, codify, and concretize narratives about these groups when the means and conditions to getting them are so incredibly disparate. So we can ask the question, I say, and here's one of my favorite cartoons, it's, it, 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 and for those of you, it may be too dark, but it says there are two kids who are down on the bottom of a pit. It says the grown-up said that education is the only way for us to climb out of this economic hole. Here, comes our re here come our rescuers now. And then you see the, the ladders, many missing steps. Come on up, kids. And this essentially is what we're doing in American society. Get those test scores high so that you can get on into high school, but we're not thinking about the means as significantly in terms of creating the stairway to mobility for many of the groups of kids who are on these different ways. So we can ask the question, both philosophically and realistically, what is it that we aspire to in American society and what is it really that's more congruent with our, our ideas, our democratic principles? And I ask the question, is it equality? From this point forward, everyone receives the same resources. I'm kind of crudely defining that. Or is it equity, where we bring everyone up to our baseline and then we apply equality? Are there fundamental thresholds in which we as a society should guarantee for all youth and families and communities? My colleagues and I in our work, it's one more just, we ask this question, it's one more just than the other. There are two philosophers, Michelle uh, Moses and John Rogers, who take on this question in the book Closing the Opportunity Gap. We as a nation have tons of good research evidence about what the opportunity gaps are, how they arise, and how to close them. And we do have some ideas about policies and interventions that should be in place that aim to tackle some of these larger contextual economic disparities issues. But the problem is we're not facing, we're not actually doing very much about them. And here is another challenge for us, I would suggest, if we just take the equality mode where everyone is just applied with the same resources. We can have absolute progress. This is just a simulation. If you look, group A, group B, group C, here is the group that's doing less well. This one's doing in the middle moderately well, and this one is doing very well. Over time, all three groups are improving over time. They all are being infused with some resources, but we still have gaps here. This is what we call the relative gap. The relative gaps are there. The absolute gaps may be even changing in places, you know, or they may be widening. And what we're seeing with the kind of unbridled, un the unbridled um, proliferation of inequality in American society is that this group is pulling away from these two groups significantly. My colleague and collaborator, Sean Reardon, who is a sociologist of education and mobility, has found that if you look over the last 40 years at various achievement tests that this country has given to students across the country, those in the top decile, the 90th percentile, children who are in household, whose household incomes are in the top decile, have pulled away from children who are in the top, in the 50th percentile, significantly, in terms of test scores. And those in the gap between the middle and the bottom and the middle of the top has remained rather wide. So even with the, with, the, with the expansion of inequality in our society, we're seeing those who are in the wealthiest house, households doing even significantly better than those if we define success as test score performance, significantly better than those who are in the middle class. 
So this is something that we have to think about, whether or not it's just applying resources so that every group improves over time, or if we need to do something more radical in terms of the infusion of resources so that we can actually reduce the kind of relative gaps that have been persistent over time. And mind you, they have closed. This is more of a simulation, but they have not closed significantly. Now, why does this matter? And I would, one of my next points is that the opportunity gaps affect all of us, whether or not we want to believe it. We may be living comfortably in our own uh, you know, affluent or middle class households, but here's how um, economists are showing that we should be caring about these things. Uh, economists Hank Levin or Henry Levin at Teachers College Columbia and Clyde Belfield at NYU have done an analysis looking out, looking at the cohort of massive school dropouts in this country. Cohorts. How that has affected our economy. For a cohort of dropouts over the course of their lives, it costs upwards of $160 billion lost fiscally in revenue, economic productivity, and taxes that an employed person will have earned. More than $600 billion are lost socially for reliance on social welfare programs, crime, cost of imprisonment, the impact on victims' lives, et cetera, over the course of that cohort of youth's lives. So it costs us as a society, as, a tax, as those of us who are taxpayers, it actually costs us. And what we're doing subsequently is spending much more money in maintaining the prison industrial complex, if you will, and spending significantly less in infusing resources in creating quite equitable educational context. That's how it's affecting all of us. Those just the authors. So where should we go with policy? And I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, and and one, there are three things that we have focused on in trying to close the opportunity gap. Three levels, thinking about students' individual needs, thinking about in-school opportunities and resources, and then thinking about what we need to do at a societal or community or neighborhood level. Students' individual needs, well, this is something that has definitely reached the, uh, as a part of the national agenda now as we turn our attention more to high quality early childhood education. And the research certainly shows that expanding access to high quality early childhood education, not all early childhood education is good education. High quality is the descriptive that matters here, really has an impact over the long term over the performance and economic, overall economic and social well-being of youth and children. The second thing that we have identified, Patricia Gandara, who, is, uh, who contributed to this volume, is correctly identifying the needs of English language learners, as I showed in the earlier slide. That is a large and growing and burgeoning demographic population in our country, and stand standard language learners. We also have to be aware of the significant social and cultural capital differences among parents and families in schools. We tend to assume, and this is where most of my research resides, is that we tend to assume that there's often, that the children are going to automatically come in school and just get with the program in terms of the cultural ethos of an educational environment. And they bring different cultural tools and resources with them, what I call non-dominant cultural capital in my own work. And that non-dominant cultural capital could be operative in their respective homes and communities, but may not be as congruent with how we expect children to um, thrive or expand um, in the school context. And so this is something else that we need to talk about. Health issues, as I mentioned. In school opportunities and resources, Linda Darling Hammond, who's my colleague at Stanford, has written extensively on, on the role of state and local funding. Inequitable allocations is at the heart of many of the gaps in students' opportunities. We still have today, colleagues and friends, schools that look very much like schools that I've seen in rural South Africa in terms of the disparities. Um, uh, in terms of the disparity in outcomes. I actually remember when I was doing research in the early 1990s, um, in Yonkers actually, uh, right here, um, I was doing research and I had a young man, I called him DeAndre in my first book, where he talked at odds about not being proud of the school. He couldn't get down with school because he's like, you know, we got broken windows, we do, sometimes we don't have toilet paper, our books, pages are torn out. We actually have conditions, Jonathan, um, Kozel has written extensively about these kinds of conditions in our school. The funding matters. Now, ideologically, many of us may debate or disagree about it, because there are some say, well, you spend a lot of money on some schools, and you still don't get the results that you need. And the question is, how is that money being spent? 
right? And is it being um, um, uh, allocated properly? Safe and well-maintained schools matter. Rich curriculum, this is something that we write extensively. How do we get kids to be fundamentally engaged in the educational progress? More and better learning time during the school year has been shown by many sociologists and other science, social scientists to have some significant impact. We also have to pay attention, I, um, according to Carolyn Tyson, a sociologist, on in the disparities within school segregation creates differential opportunities even when we create so-called diverse schools in our society. They create very disparate educational opportunities. And then we have to think about the reform and the testing process. I had a young woman tell me in, at a southern high school when I was doing research that she said, you know, she was actually, I was sitting with a group of kids, very, very, very interesting and incisive in their commentary. They were sitting in the in-school suspension in the auditorium. And I was like, you guys seem so bright. Why are you here? And I actually had a 15-year-old say to me, they don't care about us. All they care about is whether or not we do well on that test. That is some of the things that we're finding that we're hearing from our kids who are being disaffected and disillusioned by the increasing and mounting testing pressure, pressure, uh, pressure in their schools. And we, um, that's actually it. As we move to societies and communities and neighborhoods, we talk about the different things also in this book that also contribute and engender a better ecology of opportunity for our kids. Adhesion to the democratic principles of, of fairness and justice, job creation and training. You know, many of the kids that we come across in many of these poor neighborhoods are latchkey kids or their parents um, are, are unemployed. It creates additional stress serves in the household for the children. Um, and it also creates problems like just being able to barely eat every day. Children come to school hungry and can't focus on learning uh, in many times. Economic practices that more fairly distribute wealth and income. And this is something that's written by um, two historians in our book, Harvey Cantor um, and Robert Lowe. And so here are all the things. I can read these things, but I've said these things to you. I want to move next to my next major point. Um, and that's where we go inside of schools in terms of the supporting of teachers, and even when we think we might be approaching getting it right. Opportunity gaps occur when you can enter schools and notice patterns about which groups of kids are enrolled in schools and what kinds of teachers are working in those schools. Teachers are one of our most fundamental and important and create critical uh, inputs. And Barnard Berry, who's a teacher expert, has written extensively about how we can support teachers as professionals. Many teachers in schools don't feel like they're properly supported um, and don't feel, and many of them feel like they're just babysitting. I've walked into schools where I, going back to high school back in 2007 and 8, you know, highly educated and didn't want to be in a classroom. I couldn't understand, I could then understand why kids wouldn't want to be in those classrooms because the teachers seemed so detached and disassociated from, from the kids. And so some of the supports that we know from the research is that they need proper mentoring relationships. Adequate compensation matters. All of us want to be paid well. Professional development. In some of the countries that we are aiming to emulate right now, for example, Finland is often held up as an exemplar in how they're doing with their children on international testing. Well, you know, teaching is a high status profession in Finland. Only the top 10% of college graduates are, are enter the teaching profession in a place like Finland. Mind you, it's not as large, it's not as heterogeneous, but they do have diversity um, struggles and challenges like we do in the United States. But what they've done is they bet on their teachers more in terms of the apprenticeship, in terms of the support, in terms of the compensation. They don't get paid as well as doctors, but they are shown such deep appreciation in society in terms of the time they're given to work together in collaboration to develop high quality and deeply engaged curricula. My final point that I want to talk about for you is that, well, opportunity gaps manifest materially. They also manifest within the socio-cultural and political spheres of schooling. And unlike many of my colleagues who examine schooling inequality and produce the hard statistics, I embed myself in schools. I'm more of an interpretivist. I analyze what I see, I hear, and I'm told. And I've found evidence of what social scientists and policymakers should also be mindful of. 
The, there is a duality. There is what we call the hard structures in terms of the resources and money and the teachers and the technology. But I'm going to offer you something a little more what I call the softer structures, the ones that are harder to see because we're not there, the intangible ones. They don't easily show up on surveys. These softer structures include cultures of low expectations within schools, the stereotyping that happens, the de facto segregation within schools, both visible and invisible signals that we tend to send youth about who is in and who is out in terms of educational status. Um, some of this manifests itself culturally. I went into eight high schools in the US and South Africa in the last uh, several years. And there are several things that I find even when we say we value diverse schools, whether that's socioeconomically, racially, or ethnically. The approaches that we find in schools in terms of including kids can be rather colorblind and color mute, for example, so that you can have patterns where a high school can be a level five or a high performing school in this, an exemplary school in, this, in the state. And this happens in many of our schools in the country that are more affluent. And the kids who are from the more subordinate or subaltern um, or, um, or, or populations, the lower income and often um, racial and ethnic minorities, are in the lower tracks. There's a high school that was so high performing, but when I went in to look at the 292 students of African American heritage, only two or three could be deemed high achievers. How could it be a good school when it wasn't a good school for all? I asked the question. Why are some of our good schools failing our black and brown children? In my study, I, st I found stark social boundaries in these particular high schools. And I was trying to study and come to understand the extent to which kids felt flexible in moving across academic boundaries, social and cultural boundaries, participating more holistically and widely in the schools in terms of their uh, extracurricular activities. And in a school like this one, I call it South County High, there were really strong, thick, palpable boundaries. These kinds of activities were for this group of students, these kinds of classes were for this kind of student, and these class of, uh, classes for this group of students. It created fundamentally and radically different educational experiences. We also found in the schools where there were signifiers of who was in and who was out, who was worthy and who was not, through various cultural um, uh, uh, practices. Hair and language policy in my South African schools, for example. So I, I draw attention that we have to be mindful of the extent to which we're creating boundaries, even when we say it, we include. Now, there are some schools we argue, that I argue in my work, that have paid some attention to equality, but with limited insight into the structured nature of class and race inequality. And those things could happen, for example, when we create, um, um, in one of a high school not far from here, I had a group of, I remember the first day I walked into that school and students were so excited because about 120 students were on their way to Japan for about 10 days. It was going to be an exchange program. And it was also going to be a place where the kids who were in the orchestra could play. There were no kids of color going on this trip. And this was a school that for 40 plus years had been desegregating um, or trying to diversify the school population. And I asked the question, why? And what I found was another symbolic boundary. Orchestra was to the white and Asian kids as basketball and something else, stepping, where were to the, uh, the African-American and Latino kids. And so model you in in some schools or for, the, or for a certain group of kids versus other things. This is also a school where race and college selection was highly correlated in some ways. This is what I call, and there's the idea that in this particular school, we were going to treat all kids equally by, for example, not uh, tracking are not having ability grouping in terms of AP classes for um, English and, and social studies. And the reason was for that was not to create competition among the more affluent kids as they were getting ready to apply to the selective colleges and universities. It was actually not so that it could actually diversify and create the opportunity that our federal government now is trying to do through AP classes for all groups of kids, but it was to diffuse the competition at the top of the socioeconomic hierarchy. And that did not diffuse down um, to the kids who were on the bottom of the academic level in that school. The liberal ideology about how social, I'm, I argue in my work, has to be more intentionally radically egalitarian. 
attendance to the threats of academic inequality through these boundaries that we create and we often are unwittingly reproducing day to day in our school. And I found, I can tell you more and more stories about that in the Q&A, but there are all kinds of ways we unintentionally collude in the project of inequality in our day in the schools, even when we are uh, say we espouse the values of diversity in American schools. So why do these soft structures of schooling deserve attention? It's because I argue that education and schooling are not just about these outcomes of achievement. Access to strong material resources, as I mentioned, is necessary, but it's not sufficient for the study of the overall well-being of students in our society. And it is really important that we also tackle through policy and pr practice the socio-cultural and political dynamics that are embedded within our schools. We bring the social baggage with us when we come from our segregated neighborhoods, communities, um, and, and, and schools throughout the country. And the status, why this matters is because the status of intergroup dynamics and relations in schools have long-term effect on, on social, civic, and economic consequences in our society. If you think about even the midterm elections, for example, about who was involved, who feels, dis who feels disenchanted or disaffected. I mean, one could make the argument through the research that there are some relations and ties about how people feel connected in the society to one another and then therefore want to fulfill their civic obligations. So I want to end with this quote because I think, I, I want to suggest, and I do this in my work, as I think about this problem, it's a massive problem in American society. And I remember walking into an affluent suburban high school and a 15-year-old African-American boy who, whose mother was sending him to the school, he was rather critical of his high school even though he was getting, quote, a good education, good teachers, all the different great things that we know I just talked about that were a part of the speedy bullet train kind of conditions or the escalator conditions. And this kid said to me, you know, Prudence, if we really want to reduce the, the achievement gaps in our society, we also must eradicate the empathy gap. And that was very rather incisive for a 15-year-old, civic-minded. But for a 15-year-old, and it has led me to the idea of what do we do in conjunction with policy and government and practice change? Because what we are seeing, and we've seen historically in American society, that there have been, thank you, there have been some changes that are meant to eradicate the kinds of mobility differences, the kinds of contextual differences, equality and opportunity, um, uh, inequality of opportunity. But when it comes down to what's happening on the ground, often the mindsets remain quite rigid about how we're going to implement those. And that's what the 15-year-old Judah, I argue, was suggesting here is that how do we also, at a very social and social psychological level, attack inequality of opportunity, change mindsets so that we all can be expansive in terms of being inclusive in terms of making sure those kids who are on the broken stairwells can at least get on the escalator. And that's where I'll end, thank you.